let's go ahead and get started. We have an hour set aside tonight to um, talk just a little bit and update um, folks on, you know, how we're navigating these waters and, and doing school with COVID-19. So I just want to thank everybody out there that uh, joined us tonight for this webinar. And I'm going to take just a quick moment, introduce our panelists tonight. So first, I'd like to introduce Jessica Franklin, who is our lead nurse. That is a new position in the district this year. It was one that we had already budgeted for prior to COVID. So the timing was really good. So to have Jesse um, be on board with us has been really good. So Jesse was the high school, she's familiar with our district. She has kids in our district and she uh, was the high school nurse um, last year, one of the high school nurses last year. And then Dr. Brian McKinney, our chief human resource officer is here as well. And Dr. McKinney is kind of our, taking the role of data and um, making sure we understand what's going on in our community as well as what's going on in our school around COVID-19 and what the virus is doing inside our school walls as, as, as well as with our employees. So um, he's going to share some things with you tonight as well. Um, and then our featured panelist is Dr. Rachel Charney. Uh, Dr. Charney is a pediatric emergency medicine physician at SS. M. Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital. Um, she's also a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Emergency Medicine at St. Louis University School of Medicine. And she's also, um, for us, has been a, a very valuable resource for us because she's also a member of the St. Louis Pandemic Task Force, the educational committee that basically meets on, I think on Fridays, I think Dr. Charney's told me that they get in the room with everybody and, and talk of school and, you know, how are things going and, and what do our um, school leaders need uh, from us. And so it's just been tremendous to have her um, as a resource for us. And prior to us starting tonight, Dr. Charney and I were, I was reflecting with her the first time I actually had an opportunity to meet Dr. Charney was maybe the last week of February. She sent me an email that kind of said, hey, you know, we got this thing that's out here looming, not sure what it's going to do. Are you guys prepared for that? Well, I don't think anyone was prepared prepared for what, what came our way so quickly. And she uh, was kind enough to host a superintendent, a regional superintendent in-person meeting. And I think that's the last time the superintendents have been in the same room together on March the 4th um, and kind of just went over some things with us during that time. So over the last nine, 10 months, I've gotten to know Dr. Charney very well, um, had lots of conversations with her and just looking for her guidance. So I just want to publicly thank her for her service and, and just her being such a tremendous partner and a resource for our school district to help us keep our kids safe. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, I believe, Dr. McKinney first, and I think Beth's going to maybe be sharing her screen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lake, and thank oh, you. Uh, one second, Dr. McKinney, I'm sorry. sorry? The, the community that's out there, if you have questions, feel free to type those in the question and answer. Uh, Beth Johnston, who's on here as well, is our chief communications um, officer, she's going to kind of monitor those. And then um, at the end, we're going to have some time for some questions and answers. So feel free to do that as the presentation is going on. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lake. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And um, Beth, if you'll start with the slideshow. First slide, uh, we want to show our community the key indicators that we look at here at Lindbergh Schools. Uh, we track these uh, data points every single day. We develop a spreadsheet that goes out to Dr. Lake and others, just so everyone knows exactly um, where uh, the virus stands. And the community data um, are the first few bullet points. The transmission rate, we get that from Show Me Strong, which is a website published by the Missouri Department of Public Health. The St. Louis County positivity rate, which tells us uh, the percentage of tests that come back positive, that is, um, provided to us by uh, St. Louis County Public Health Department. And then the new cases per 100,000 in St. Louis County, we get that from a website called Path to Zero and it's developed by the Harvard Global Institute. We also get to look at uh, a lot of data within our own school district with age groups of students. And that data is provided to us starting um, in September by the St. Louis um, Public Health Task Force and Dr. Charney is a member of that group, and I know she'll talk more about that when it's uh, her turn to speak. Next slide, please. So this is the age group um, positivity rates that I mentioned, and you can see that the first 
um, group of school districts are our neighbors. And the second group are districts that have been in school five days a week since uh, September. And what you'll notice is that the positivity rates for the districts that have been um, not in school or in a hybrid mode really is similar to those that have been in school five days a week. So as you take a look through that data, you can see that being in school doesn't necessarily um, lead to um, higher positivity rates in students in these age groups. I'm sorry, my, my um, computer is doing some odd things here. This is our Lindbergh School District data. And as you can see, the bottom lines are the positivity rates and those are very low, um, relatively low. And we're happy for that, we're very fortunate. The green line is the um, quarantine rates. And we have spent um, a great deal of time working through the quarantine process, but we believe that it's been a successful mitigation strategy. And we are um, thankful that these mitigating strategies, that being one of them have uh, kept our positivity rates in our schools with our staff and our students relatively low. Yeah, and I, I wanna jump in real quick, Brian. Um, I just wanna point out to the folks out there, if you look at that peak for us, that's a little more than I think two weeks after Halloween. And that's critical, I, I think, for people to understand. When we have events and, and things in our community that we're accustomed to gathering and socializing can really have a large impact, um, not necessarily on transmission in our schools, because we're still seeing very little of that, but the number of people that come to school with it and then resulting in having uh, to quarantine quite a few um, students. So you can see, since we've gone past that, um, it, it has really started to come down. And I will say, and Brian and Jesse, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we, us taking those three days after Thanksgiving, um, we've at this point we've only had to quarantine one classroom, I believe, since we've returned. So we've seen um, very um, very positive results from that, and we're probably in the best position we've been with number of staff quarantine as well as number of students in the district right now. That's absolutely right, and you can see just that that eight fourteen down to two forty seven is an amazing difference. Um, same with staff. Next slide, please, Beth. Finally, um, just wanted to talk about our gating criteria. This um, gating criteria guide was developed um, last summer in July, and it was developed really before we knew how COVID-19 would act in a school setting. What we've learned through our experience since July to the middle of December now is that when schools uh, implement proper mitigating strategies such as mask wearing, social distancing, quarantining, schools are really a safe place. Um, you can see from our data and our, our, our dashboard in the previous slide that we haven't seen a great deal of transmission in our schools, very little from student to student, from staff to staff, or from staff to student. We're fortunate and we, we're very thankful that that has been the case, um, but we feel like that um, when kids come to school, when our staff is in school, they're in a safe place and we have mitigation strategies that are that are, um, we adhere to strictly um, and they're enforced. Um, we've also noticed that school, schools being in session hasn't, hasn't created transmission within the community. So COVID-19 is not being transmitted in our schools and then being taken out to the broader community. Of course, we will continue to monitor all of the key indicators and um, continue with our daily reports. But to this point, um, schools have been a very safe place to be in this environment. And um, Jessica, if you have anything to add um, regarding the, the um, current situation in our schools, uh, I'd be happy to turn it over to you for some comments. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all um, who have come here tonight to join us while we try to um, answer some questions that we've been hearing from the community. Um, the only thing that I want to add with the, um, with regards to the gating criteria, with that being one of the points that we are looking at, um, whenever we're in the red, um, according to that gating criteria, I think it's important for people to understand that that's also when a stay-at-home order is in place. Um, and so we can go ahead and go to the next slide and I'll start talking a little bit about um, the quarantine process that Lindbergh Schools uses. So Lindbergh Schools works 
um, very closely with the St. Louis County Public Health Department, um, and we do follow their quarantine guidelines. Um, right now, they are aware that the CDC has made some changes to their guidelines, and they are looking um, to see if that's something that they can make some changes to theirs. Right now, um, they've said that because of the high positivity rate and the high transmission rate within our community, they don't wanna make those changes at this time, but it's something that they are reviewing. So this graphic here has been around for a while for everyone. Um, and so it just lets people know that 10 days for a positive student or staff member, 14 days if they have been in contact with someone who is positive. And then the 24 days comes into play when you have a positive person within your household. So if you have a positive person in the household, then um, everyone who is living in the home is supposed to quarantine during their isolation period of 10 days plus the additional 14 days from the contact. And then you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, we have a lot of questions from people about how decisions are made with regard to quarantining um, cohorts versus classrooms. Um, in the majority of the time, the county health department is gonna have us quarantine the entire classroom at the elementary level. And the reason for that is because of the possibility of aerosol transmission when you spend an extended amount of time um, with, this, with the positive person in one space. So since our early childhood classes and our elementary school classes spend the majority of the day in the same classroom, that's why the entire classroom has to quarantine versus just the cohort. We do find the cohorting to be very beneficial as a mitigating measure to keep spread from happening in the classrooms. So that's why we still practice both. And then with the middle school and high school, we are able to um, usually just do the direct contacts, which is um, those who are within six feet of the positive person for more than 15 minutes. And the difference for that would be if, um, if a student sat next to the positive person in multiple class periods and they were adjacent to that person for more than two hours, because that is kind of, um, that's the tipping point for the health department for feeling like that is an extended period of time with that individual. There are some special circumstances for band and choir, and I just wanted to mention that briefly. So even if they are spaced out more than six feet, they'll still recommend some quarantine um, depending on the activities that they were doing in those classes. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So this just reviews our daily health screening that we ask all of our families and all of our staff members to do each day to make sure that everyone is healthy whenever they're coming into our schools. Um, that is a huge help for us in not having to quarantine um, as many classrooms. And so we ask that everyone do their daily health screening. We're using masking and social distancing as much as possible, the cohorting, and then of course, hand washing and sanitizing. And then I just wanna stress that quarantine is just the next mitigating measure that we're using to keep spread from happening in our schools. You can go ahead to the next slide. So our contact tracers are mostly our school nurses, our health room assistants, and our administrators. And those contact tracers are looking through the two days before a person um, becomes symptomatic or the two days before they're tested if they have no symptoms. And that's because the CDC and the public health department has found that that is when a person is contagious. So they go through their whole schedule, they go through their bus routes, they do interviews with the teachers and the parents to figure out who all they've been around. And then those contacts are all notified. You can go ahead to the next slide. So in the communication piece, once we finish the contact tracing um, for the positive case, then we do um, a phone call, either a robocall um, or a phone call from the administrators and also send an email. Um, to anyone who was a direct contact. 
for the cases that don't have any direct contacts, um, if there was a shared space, so for example, if we had a positive case at the middle school or the high school who did not have direct contacts, those classmates um, or the people who rode on the bus with that person, if it was a student, would still receive a letter to let them know that they were in the same space as someone who um, has tested positive for COVID. If a classroom closes at the elementary level um, or the early childhood level, we do send out a notice to the entire school building so that they're aware. Um, and then you can go ahead to the next slide. So for tracking our transmission, the way that we are able to tell if we're having spread in our schools um, is each of our staff members and students who are under quarantine are tracked by our contact tracers to see if they develop any symptoms um, or if they test positive during their quarantined time. So, so far we have um, had very few cases where individuals have become positive during quarantine, um, especially when all of the mitigating strategies were in place. So we have had a couple of cases, um, especially surrounding athletics, um, where masks weren't being used and social distancing wasn't possible. Um, but overwhelmingly in the classrooms, we have not been seeing that. So if anybody has anything to add there, if not, then I will turn it over to Dr. Charney. So before we do that, Beth, I think there was a couple questions in there that I can just knock out really quick. When, one of them is, when is middle school um, going to go full in person? We don't have a, a date for that. Um, you know, it, through this whole thing, we have to always be making plans and being ready to pivot. I would say right now, there's quite a bit of virus that's being spread out in the community. So if it's out, if there's quite a bit out in the community, bringing more people more often into the schools would lend itself to quarantining. Not that we believe that it would potentially um, be spread as a result of having kids there five days a week or four days a week, whatever that might look like. It's more about the number of quarantines results in teachers and adults and can we actually operate school efficiently and have enough bodies to be able to teach and learn and, and do those kinds of things. So we, we're working on plans for that, but we don't have a, a set date yet. And then um, I, I think Jesse just answered this. There's a question here that says, you know, how can you say transmission is not happening in schools? It, it's not happening in schools. Kids are catching it in the community. And then as a result, coming to school with it, and then that result of them bringing it into the school is quarantining our students and our staff in certain cases. And like Jesse explained, we're tracking all of that to see who can, who tests positive while they're in quarantine or who shows symptoms and all of that. And we're seeing very little to none, especially in, from a classroom setting. Our athletics and activities, like Jesse mentioned, but when we're in our classroom setting and we are doing all of our mitigation strategies and all of the things that we have in place, social distancing the best we can, doing those kinds of things, masking, washing hands, doing all that. We, we just are not seeing transmission to transmission in the, in the classroom. Okay, Dr. Charney, it's you. All right, well, thank you um, for having me here to speak as well. Uh, I didn't bring any slides. I'm more of an off the cuff kind of talker. Um, I do, I think, I don't think it was added at this point. I'm also a Limburg mom. Um, I've got two elementary schoolers and a middle schooler. So um, Lindbergh's been very important to me as well as just the strategies that Lindbergh's been putting in place to keep our children healthy um, is of course very important to me as both a healthcare worker and as a mom of, of kids here. Uh, so I, uh, beyond being a pediatric emergency medicine physician, I'm also the medical director for disaster preparedness for my school of medicine and also for Cardinal Glennon. And that's how I became involved in this process. Um, I have a another appointment in our School of Public Health. And one of the things that we started doing this summer when we saw that there was just a need to really look community-wide at how we were going to get children back to school safely and what those processes should look like, what kind of mitigation strategies, et cetera, we brought together a team of us um, underneath the pandemic task force uh, called the Education Task Force 
to weekly address concerns. And as members of that, we have um, public uh, Department of Public Health representation, pediatric infectious disease representation, um, myself, uh, Dr. Garza takes uh, part in a lot of our conversations as well as, as, as having superintendent um, representation. And we really try and look very carefully at the available literature, what is going on in our community, how that's impacted, whether or not what's going on in our community needs to change how we're processing things in school, and then looking at uh, the mitigation strategies and how that's impacting our schools as well. Um, one of the things I will um, say is that what Dr. Lake was saying about the transmission rates in school, and that's based on following the percentage of children who become positive, who've been put into quarantine and thereby um, potentially exposed to those uh, positive cases has been slightly less than or approximately 1%. So it is quite low. Um, however, it was in the news a week or two ago, also that the CDC is looking in the Missouri area to say, okay, what, what are the connections there? Are there actual, are there DNA connections where we can see if those two cases are related and how well are our mitigation strategies uh, looking? And I think that that research, it's not changing anything about how we're quarantining or how we're protecting our campuses, but just looking at the impacts of that. So um, we're, we should have hopefully when those type of, of projects are, are completed, that's going to just continue to inform our processes. Um, other than that, um, we did, our community numbers have been coming down since Thanksgiving, which is, um, fantastic news. We are still, of course, higher than we were in September and early October, um, and we want to get back down to where we were. But the downward trend, um, we're all hoping that that's going to continue. Um, if Thanksgiving and um, the gatherings that were related to that are in going to impact our community, we anticipate to see those impacts taking place around this week. So we are watching all very closely to see what's going to happen. Um, we did anticipate we'd be higher than we are right now going after we were looking at what Thanksgiving was going to do to impact, but um, clearly the efforts that our community is taking part in are working to lower those, those rates so far. So. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more time. I'd rather do it with question and answer, but um, I will just also say that there is a um, a database that the Education Task Force uses and looks at that tracks the state data coming back that allows us to look at um, particularly the number of cases in school children broken up by uh, five-year groups. Um, and we can actually look at that data based on school district. We can look at it based on county. It gives us sort of what's going on in the last two weeks. And what we see in the ch pediatric, the children age range um, is that we did, all those ranges did go up as the community did, though it has been much lower in those pediatric ranges than in our adult population. I would say the one exception would be the, the 20 to 24 year olds tends to be included and is included in that young adult age period too. And they have been much closer to the rest of the adult population. And then our 15 to 20 year olds tend to be closer to that compared to our 14 and under. And happy to answer any questions you guys might have. And um, again, just thank you for allowing me to participate. I see there's another question, right, Beth, in there, but it looks like it's more for- I believe that question is probably for you. Yeah, so um, you will receive some communication Friday around potential um, calendar changes. The board took some action with the calendar last night and we're having some other conversations this week, um, finishing up some conversations, but you'll there will be communication coming out Friday. So um, once, we, once we kind of finalize all that, you will get that, so. And for those of you who didn't see the question in the box, um, the question was, was regarding virtual days following the holiday break as a mitigation strategy. Because we have, I think, New Year's falls on Friday, I believe it is. So the board um, last night took action that basically we, we will re be returning students on that Thursday instead of the Tuesday. So, um, but there, well, though we have some other calendar things that we're going to put in a communication on Friday. Other questions? Don't be shy. Because trust me, I get emails every day almost <laughs> with questions. So maybe those maybe those folks aren't aren't on here tonight. So and we love the questions and we love the emails because we want you all to be informed. 
Well, I'll take this minute just to say, if you have a substitute teacher certificate and you're out there and you want to get in these schools and help with this situation, we will always welcome you to uh, join our substitute teaching force. That's my, my plug for this evening. Thank you. I do see a question um, looking at now that we know that the type of mask can make a difference. Um, what type of mask are we, do we allow students and staff to wear? And I can let Jessica address this, but we, are, we do follow CDC guidelines on face coverings. Yeah, so um, to date, the only masks that we do not allow are the ones that have the vents on them because those are just one-way valves. Um, we have, I believe that our building nurses have reached out to families um, of parents who are using like the gator style face covering um, to make sure that they're aware that there are some studies going on um, about the effectiveness of them. I don't know if Dr. Cherney, if you wanna chime in on, on the different types of face coverings to use. Um, yeah, in general, what the studies are finding is that the more layers, the better, which makes perfect sense. Um, the tighter the weave, the better. Uh, usually about three layers uh, to five layers, depending on what's tolerated is, is the recommended um, amount. Clearly, uh, the more it's fitting to your face, the better we're going to see. And that's why things like bandanas or just plain face shields don't seem to be as effective. Uh, I think that's most of the information we have. Um, the ones that are more fancy with sparklies all over them are less likely to be effective than your plain cloth layers. They look good though, right? Yeah. <laughs> They do. It's kind of the, the accessory of 2020, right? Your face covering. Mm -hmm. I will also say just because we started introducing this in one of our clinics, um, a lot of people have problems with the cloth masks falling down over your noses because they're just not fit to it. Um, if anyone is having difficulty with that, they have adhesive metal nose pieces that you can get at like Amazon and other places that are incredibly inexpensive that you can stick to your mask that'll then allow you to form fit it. You put it on the outside of the mask and then it won't fall down over your nose. We've been pretty successful with that in our clinics where we had problems. I do see a follow-up question here regarding um, face coverings asking if masks are required for middle school and high school PE classes as a mitigation strategy. So I honestly don't recall if it's a requirement, um, but I know that it is a recommendation to wear it as often as possible. Um, my own daughter is a middle schooler and she has been wearing hers through her PE class. Um, so I'm pretty sure that they are using them through PE classes. Yes. I'm not positive. Go ahead, Brian. Were you going to say something? No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just like if you go to the gym, out in the community, you have to wear a face covering. We, we've, that, that's, that is our practice. And I'm seeing here too, uh, that ear savers and extenders help keep your mask in place throughout the day. Thank you for that comment too. Um, let's see, question about the infection and transmission rate of COVID, um, a clarification of whether that is, that transmission rate is lower in the school population than the general community population, and a question, Dr. Charney, of where people can find the data that you are referencing. Um, the data that we have is um, internal data, uh, just due to the nature of the agreement we got to get access to that data. So um, it's only shared with a select group, so unfortunately it's not public. Um, however, I will say, when I'm talking about the Lindbergh data being something we can look at, it's not the Lindbergh school population, it's the zip codes that contribute to the Lindbergh school district. So that is looking at the entire population. And as you know, that in general, um, initially, if you look back a couple months ago, the South County area was fairly spared compared to other parts of, of St. Louis County. And that has not been the case the last few weeks. Um, I was always pretty excited that my zip code was, was always in that really light color. And then all of a sudden I looked one day and it was dark, dark purple and it made me kind of sad, but hopefully we'll get back to the light purple again. And I know, Jessica, you spoke to how you're tracking the transmission that is happening um, and how we can speak to that. Yes, just, um, just with 
looking at all of the kids who are quarantined, who've been exposed and the staff members who have been exposed in the classroom and seeing if any of those um, individuals are developing any symptoms or testing positive. We do have a fair amount of people who will go and get tested um, during quarantine so that they know for their own peace of mind um, if their kiddos or if it's a staff member, if the staff member um, is positive after that exposure. It is recommended that you wait five to seven days after your exposure to get that test done. Um, so you have less of a chance at a false negative. Um, but we do have a fair amount of people who do get tested and not very many are coming back positive. I would also add that if you're getting a test and you do not have symptoms, you really should make sure you're getting a molecular or PCR test, not a rapid, uh, one of the rapid antigen tests, because those are meant for people with symptoms and are a lot less accurate in asymptomatic people as far as giving you um, a, a true positive, a positive result when you're truly positive. Thank you for that, Dr. Charney. And I did put a link in our chat. Um, Jessica and her team have developed a checklist for families. If someone in your family tests positive or develops symptoms, what are the steps you should take with regard to communicating with school, getting a test, and that does speak to that as well. Um, tacking onto that, this is not a question. This was just an, a, a nice comment and feedback to thank all of our nurses and our teachers for their hard work this past semester. And I'm sure all of you can speak to that, just how much they've been going above and beyond. Yes, our nurses have been working absolutely tirelessly. So we really appreciate um, all of the patience that everybody has had. Um, we know that this has been a really hard year. Um, and we know that sometimes the things that we are, um, the things that we're putting in place can be kind of confusing. So I do urge everyone, you know, Dr. Lake had spoken to the email um, I do urge everyone, um, if you do have any questions about why something's being done, um, I'm a big advocate for explaining why something was done instead of just like, because that's what we said. Um, and so if you ever have a question about why a quarantine was done a certain way or why you need to have a certain thing to come back to school after you've been sick, um, please reach out and we're so happy to answer those questions. Um, the nurses do follow an algorithm um, that was put together by a team of pediatricians this summer, and that algorithm was approved by the health department for us to use. Um, it's used by all of the St. Louis County public schools, and so um, on that algorithm, it gives exactly what needs to be completed prior to returning to school. Um, when kids are having symptoms, and it varies depending on what the symptom is or how many symptoms. Um, and one of the things that's on there is the PCR test that Dr. Charney had talked about. Um, and so it's really important um, that you guys have all those answers. So just always feel free to reach out and ask. I would just add about um, the nurses. We've we've learned that COVID does not take off at 4.30 and it does not take off Saturdays and Sundays. And so uh, I just wanna thank the nurses. They've been available on weekends. Um, Dr. Lake and the board allowed us to hire, um, provided for us to hire two contact tracers now that work on weekends. And that hopefully has provided some support to nurses and um, our HR director and, and Jessica, but um, what a great job by our nursing staff, definitely. Great, the next question is in regard to um, teachers opening their windows during the day to allow fresh air into the classroom and asking, is that a practice that all classrooms are doing? So here, I'll kind of answer, is that a pra practice that all classrooms are doing? Then Dr. Charney can, if she wants to chime in on the research, I think there is some research out there. I think it was maybe German in, uh, in Germany, the schools having their windows open. I think I read an, uh, uh, a study about that, but we it's not, mandatory that every one of the classrooms do it. We encourage teachers to do that. We've also purchased air purifiers with classrooms that don't have windows or can't um, open their windows like at the high school because of construction. Um, so we have been encouraging that. All of our HVA systems are set to pump in as much fresh air as they possibly can, which our electric bills are gonna be um, a lot higher than they typically would be. So we're, we're trying to move as much fresh air through that, through that space as we possibly can. So 
And then I think there's another, the question is, go ahead, Beth, read that next question. Oh, Dr. Charney, sorry. Do you want to talk anything about the fresh air and the research? No, I think, I think you basically covered it. it. It does seem to improve the general airflow and, and decrease, you know, how that virus, how long that virus is hanging out around you. Yep. So the next question, um, this was addressed earlier in the webinar, but for those of you who have joined us a little bit later, um, talking about how we will, how we measure movement among phases in our green light plan and make a decision whether or not to be virtual or in person. So I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll take that one. So back in July, um, you know, when we looked at the global, the Harvard Global Institute's, you know, gating metrics, there were still a lot of assumptions that schools potentially could be a place where it could be super spreading events and the virus could run, you know, kind of wild through that. So at, at that time, people were, were thinking that, you know, being in school could really impact community, you know, positivity rates and transmission of what's going on. But what we're seeing is really schools being open is not really indication that we're helping to contribute to the community spread. It's spreading in the community, but not necessarily as a result of us having our schools open. So we, we will continue to monitor community data because that is very, very important and we need to keep that. But that's just one piece of the pie that goes into our decision making, ongoing conversations with our health department. What are they telling us? You know, um, what, how are they advising us? Every decision we've made about phasing, whether that was us starting elementary in a hybrid, like we did with our K3 kiddos. I was in conversations directly with Spring Schmidt about here's what we're going to do. Are you comfortable with this? Can you support this? All of those things. So that that piece of the puzzle. And if you remember. You know, the health department was recommending that schools not do that, but we had had our early childhood open since early July and had lots of success and had learned a lot about on a smaller scale of what it would take to operate in a school setting. So they're not recommending right now that schools go back to that. When you're seeing schools transition back to an all virtual phase, um, and I won't speak to 100% with my colleagues um, out there, but I, I am in communication with them a lot. But for instance, I know one of our neighboring districts took their high school back to virtual. It, it was really about a workforce load. It's about, can you have enough teachers be available that aren't on quarantine and support staff and all of those things. And so basically what they did is they took resources and funneled those down to the middle and the elementary schools in order to keep those schools open because our priority you know, needs to be that we keep all of our kids in school as safe as we can, as many days as we can, but it's that elementary age school kid that um, really needs to be our, our focus in keeping them, them in. They, they tend to have a more difficult time surviving and learning on that um, digital or that, that virtual um, platform. So lots of things go into it. How's the virus interacting and how, what, what's it doing in our schools? Conversations with the health department, what's going on in the community, all of those things. So there is no magic number of gating, you know, we're, we hit this point and now we're going to all go back to virtual. So um, it, it really has shifted more to what is the virus, how is, what's the virus doing inside our school walls and, and, and what's going on there. So I hope that helps. Great, thank you. The next question is in regard to counseling services and asking whether there are counseling services available for students or teachers who have been struggling with the COVID requirements and restrictions. I can answer the one about staff. Um, we have um, a resource for staff members for um, mental health all, always, not just during this time, but we've made sure to provide a lot of information to our staff about those resources uh, if, if they need those. And, and our counseling staff is also working very hard to make sure that our students feel supported in, in the schools. I will also say that um, if you go to the county's website, which is stlcorona.com, uh, that there is a resources tab and under that is resources, not just for mental health, but for all sorts of things, food assistance, et cetera. Um, and it, but it does have a mental health resource tab and has some phone numbers, one of which is specifically for COVID anxiety concerns um, that people can reach out to. And it appears to have some telehealth options. As a follow-up to that question, here is a question specific to the high school, which we may need to check on and get back with you, Amy, but um, asking are the high school counselors still sending out temperature checks to check in on students? following up with students who are struggling and just talk, speaking to ways that teachers and staff are checking in on their students during this time. So I'll also, Tara Sparks, if you don't know who Tara is, she's our chief academic officer. These questions are 
in her, she's in more into the details of this. She just texted me that lots of resources for SEL and ongoing monitoring. So I'm assuming that if, if the counselors were doing their temperature checks, they would continue to do those as well. But we can we can get you some more information about that. Um, okay, great. Next question is, will contact tracers with the district be available over the winter break if anyone has concerns while school is out? I can take that one. Uh, we'll have a, a several reminders going out that says to even though you're on break, if you have COVID related um, experiences, whether, you know, testing positive or are coming becoming um, in exposed to, then um, we're going to we're going to have ways for that to be communicated to the district. Yes. Thank you. And then um, this question is regarding has there been any impact seen on first quarter student grades or attendance? as a result of COVID. Sure, and I can take this, and again, Tara would have more of the details to this, but yes, I, I would say um, we have seen that. Uh, I don't think we're seeing anything more than what you would see what's going on nationally. Um, it, it's, you know, it's a challenging time, but our folks are being very proactive and understanding. Uh, we're really focusing, you know, on making sure that we have the interventions in place. We've even at the secondary level, been bringing some students in um, uh, four days a week for interventions and get, making sure that we get them caught up and doing some things like that. So yes, um, we, we have seen that, but we, we believe we are making some progress with that. Um, not anything like we probably saw fourth quarter. The, the learning um, is definitely um, different um, this first semester um, virtually than it, than it was fourth quarter last year. Okay, and the, um, as community transmission has continued to rise, have the schools put in place any additional safety measures or PPE? So I think that the additional measures that we have um, implemented is the hiring of additional contact tracers to make sure that we can keep up um, and make sure that people are being notified of exposures that they're having um, and quarantined in, um, in an appropriate time. Um, the nurses were all working very tirelessly, um, as Brian had indicated. And so we were working around the clock seven days a week to make sure that that was um, taken care of. So having the additional staff on board to help us make sure that we're able to do that in a timely manner has been very helpful. Oh, and I would, go ahead, Dr. Charney, go. I was just going to also add that um, that same STL Corona website, so stlcorona.com um, slash quarantine or slash isolation will give you isolation and quarantine instructions. That can be very helpful if you have an exposure or case that is not related to in your home that's not related to school um, and you want information right away because we know the county department's public health is, is moving as fast as humanly possible but um, can't always call uh, immediately as soon as you get results. So that page can be very helpful for getting um, instructions and it's down in the chat box too. And just to the overall PPE, we've had PPE in place from day one, plexiglass where we felt like we needed it, air purifiers, you know, furniture, different types of furniture that, you know, we, prior to COVID, you know, we really creating environments in our spaces, in our classrooms around collaboration, putting kids in teams working. So we had to make some pivots to types of furniture we had in our classrooms as well. Um, so, yeah, so the PPE has been in, been in place, but I think Jesse's right, adding those contact tracers on the weekend has really, really helped us. I don't see any new questions right now. If anyone else has a question, now's the time to type it in. We've got about 15 minutes left if you do have questions. What are things that parents can do to support staff during this time? You know, I'll, I'll let Brian and whoever, and maybe from, you know, Jesse's a parent as well as Rachel, you know, um, I'll, I'll just say this. And I had a conversation with somebody, a parent the other day on the phone and you know, it's just, I, I, I guess, grace um, and, you know, just give them that grace that we need right now that we're, everyone has good intentions and we have to assume that everyone's intentions are good and positive and we're trying to do the right thing. You know, folks, we're dealing with something that hasn't happened in a hundred years. It's not like this happened five, six, seven years ago uh, and we learned a bunch and now we're back in the same environment. And so just, just that, I, I, I think everyone is 
putting their best foot forward. And I have just seen such an amazing dedication and a can do attitude from our staff. You know, I will just tell you, our teachers have just been phenomenal about asking the right questions for their own safety, but knowing that our kids need to be in school and we need to be educating them. And there is nothing that can replace an in-person education. And they have just gone above and beyond. Our support staff has been right there with us, supporting our, our teachers in the classroom and everyone from the office staff to our cafeteria, to our custodial, everyone has just put that in. So just when, when, when and I know you, this is a stressful time and an emotional time. So when you feel that, just know that if you see something that isn't sitting right with you, just just come at it from a lens of best foot forward, good intentions are there, not not any kind of harm. So that, that, that's what I would say, so. Here's a clarification um, regarding Dr. Lake that you mentioned students come in for four days a week um, for interventions, asking if that's also at the high school and I believe it is, correct? Yeah, I, that's the only place right now that I believe that that's happening. Oh, and, and it's really focusing on our seniors for graduation. So right now, because we got to make sure that we keep those kid, kiddos on track to graduate. Great. Um, here is a question about the dashboard data on our website asking about how it is divided out um, elementary versus secondary and regarding middle schools and high schools. Um, I would just say that we, when we developed it, we wanted to make sure that we were very transparent and the information showed our community what was going on, but we also wanted to be careful with individuals' privacy. And um, that's, a, that's a, sometimes a tough, a tough uh, line to toe. Uh, so the way we've, we've placed it there, we hope that we can show um, you all what's going on in our schools, but also not have data that's uh, personally identifiable to someone that might be um, might be positive for COVID. So oh, I do see a response here in our Q&A from um, Ann Kleitz regarding counseling. So I can go ahead and just read this for everyone. Building counselors and social workers are continuing to support students and families as they do in a typical year, but they are also working to address the unique needs of the pandemic. Please reach out to your building counselor or social worker, whether you are in person or virtual. They can support you or make an appropriate referral to the many ag agencies that we partner with. Thank you, Anne, for that. We appreciate that. And I'll also say that we as PD the pediatric community know that behavioral health needs are increased um, during the pandemic. And so all of our pediatric hospitals in the area have been working to try and increase that ability to support our community as well and make as much uh, psychological and psychiatric aid available too. So you can always reach out to your pediatric hospitals. Great, thank you for that. Um, here is a question about fall of 2021 and <laughs> when that decision will be made. <laughs> Well, uh, that, that's, oh. you got us there, Robert, is all I'm going to tell you. We, we're, we, we tend to really be forward thinking and, and planning ahead and, and not be reactionary, um, but we're, we're not quite there for that. But, um, you know, if, if we find ourselves in a situation similar to what we are today, you know, just like we did in the summertime, we would put information out there around that. So, and I don't know, Dr. Charney, if you have any thoughts about you know, springtime, vaccination, maybe give an overview of that. I don't, know, I don't want to put uh, you on the spot, but I know you're not a fortune well, teller or anything like that. But no, just, that's okay. If you've watched the news lately, you'll realize I'm on the, uh, I'm on the vaccine planning committees as well. So I've had my fingers in that pot. Um, yeah, so uh, just a general vaccine overview. Um, this week, the FDA is going to hear the first, going to have the first hearing with Pfizer regarding their EUA request. Um, we anticipate a decision will be made on that um, by late, probably this weekend, the latest. Um, so we could be seeing vaccine that's going to be aimed at our highest, highest risk, which is healthcare, long-term care, et cetera. Um, with by just around the week or so before at Christmas. Um, it's nothing like planning a vaccine campaign in, over the holidays, uh, but, we're very excited about seeing that data. I just saw the, the actual data that's being released today and looking over it. Um, the anticipation is that 
the goal is to be able to have vaccine available to anyone who wants it by sometime early summer. Um, of course, all of that is very, very, very dependent on how many vaccines get approved, um, what goes on with manufacturing, any difficulties there. Um, but that is the goal right now. Uh, reading the data that was publicly released by Pfizer, they're requesting age 16 and up. Um, there are some studies that are going on right now in adolescents too for vaccine trials, but I haven't heard anything clear on children. Um, but uh, I would say that similar to what we were talking about before, um, when it comes to a vaccine campaign that is going to be of the size and scope of this one, grace is going to be very necessary for all of us. There are going to be frustrations there are going to be delays. Um, there's going to be, you know, communication issues. It, it's just going to be a, it's going to be a hard campaign. And um, there is an inordinate amount of work going into planning for this vaccination already. Um, so lots of grace. And I think everyone wants to get a safe vaccine into the arms of as many people as possible as soon as possible. Great. Right. I'm not seeing any questions right now. Yeah, so we have about nine minutes left. So, and again, we can end early if we don't have to, you know, back when I was teaching social studies, I had good wait time for my, for my class when I was wanting an answer, but we don't have to practice wait time tonight. We can, we can end early. So, but I will give it just one more, just something here, just a few more seconds. If anybody does have a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A. Well, again, um, I just want to say to you all out there, the, the, the participants out there, thank you for joining in with us tonight. And I do want to just give a special thanks to Dr. Charney for, again, not, not just tonight, but just her partnership and, um, and her just being such a valuable resource for us to be able to get our schools open and just uh, and do it safely and, and put the best, best foot forward. And, you know, she was also a part of our green light plan development on one of our subcommittees this summer. And, you know, so she's just been tremendous, tremendous uh, resource for us. So thank you, Dr. Charney, for, for everything you've done for our, our, our community. I, I really, really, really appreciate it. So yeah. Uh, that, yep. And Jesse and Brian, thank you guys for being here tonight. Yeah, and Beth, more questions. Do, yes. Yeah. Oh, well, more questions. One more question. Um, it's a curriculum related question regarding um, amending requirements to accommodate less face to face time with students and teachers, um, such as an elective like choir meeting twice a week is difficult for a class like that. Has there been discussion on focusing more on core classes to ease the burden on our students for the time being? That would, we'll probably, we'll need to get back with Stephanie on that. Okay. So. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very detailed, weedy teaching and learning question that um, Tara, I know, would be able to answer. So, all right. And I want to remind everyone that this is recorded, and so we will share out a recording of this webinar in our principal's weekly e-notes, and it'll be on our district YouTube channel Yes, for anyone who wasn't able to attend. Awesome. All right. Well, Stephanie, Tara just texted me, you know, basically the focus will really be around our priority standards around that. So I'm not sure if that answers all of that big question. So um, we'll, we'll get back with you on, on that. So, okay. Anybody, anything else out there? Awesome. Thank you, Kim, for your, for your nice comments. Appreciate it. So y'all have a great evening. And again, thank you for your partnership and um, trusting this with your with your kiddos. I, I really appreciate it. You guys all have a great night. Thanks.